Well, hey everybody. Uh, so you may have noticed that things are a little different right now. We had a slight malfunction with the uh, the technical stuff this morning because we got a new computer, and so every once in a while, when new things happen, things go wrong. So uh, I'm going to be joining you today, uh, not from the pulpit, uh, but uh, like this. I didn't want to have a Sunday where we don't have a message going out for those of you who join us remotely. Uh, for me, it feels like a care thing. It's one of those things where you know, not everybody can make it all the time. Uh, but even if you can't make it, we want to make sure that you don't feel like there's some sort of, you know, this sort of, sort of tier list when it comes to how we treat people in the congregation, that those who uh, are able to join us in person on a Sunday morning are like first-class citizens, and then everybody else is sort of an afterthought. I don't want to give that impression. You are loved, you are valued, and we want to make sure that uh, if the message is something that you come here for on a regular basis, that you've actually got something going for you. So I'm going to do it a little different today. I'm going to deliver it for you uh, without the rest of the congregation here. So hopefully next week we'll be back to normal. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Father God, even as we are joining one another uh, in, in this way. Lord, I want to ask that uh, as we dive into your word together, that God, you would be with us, that God, you would be speaking through your word to us today. In your name we pray, God. Amen. So the way I started off today was basically by saying this, that you've been hearing a lot of the same message from up in the pulpit for the past year as we've been going through this this walk through the book of Matthew together. Uh, for example, you've heard me say a lot that Jesus is so culturally pervasive that it's difficult to find anybody within our, our, our realm, our, our neighborhood or our country or wherever. It's difficult to find somebody who doesn't at least have a picture of what they think Jesus looks like when you mention his name and how that picture is very much informed by what they know about him, whether they've heard about him from scripture or whether they've heard about him from stuff online or whether they've heard about him through, uh, you know, TV preachers or TV shows or books or opinions or whatever else. Everybody, I think, has this picture of Jesus that is informed by what they know about him. Uh, the other thing that you've heard me say quite often is that followers of Jesus need to make sure that that picture that we have in our heads that we take time to actually compare it to the Jesus who is revealed in Scripture to make sure that what we're carrying around is a portrait of Jesus as he's revealed as opposed to a caricature of Jesus that embellishes features uh, about him that we enjoy and possibly diminishes some of them that make us feel uncomfortable or that we may disagree with or things that we just kind of want to ignore. We need to make sure that as followers of Jesus, we ha are taking or we are carrying a picture of Jesus around that is informed by the way that he is revealed in Scripture as opposed to carrying a caricature of Jesus with us. I've repeated myself a lot this year, and I want to make sure that we, we're all kind of on the same page about the fact that I've done that on purpose because I believe that repetition is a necessary part of, of discipleship. I think it's good to have things put in front of us often so that we have many opportunities to respond if we miss out the first time. Or even if we haven't missed out the first time, we've got another opportunity to examine ourselves. In his book, You Can't Go Home, Thomas Wolfe proverbially wrote these words, I have to see a thing a thousand times before I've seen it once. And the Apostle Peter wrote to the church, to the churches of Asia Minor in Second Peter 1, verses 12 through 13. I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep reminding you as long as I live. Long story short, I'm okay with a little repetition in the pulpit. I'm okay with being repetitive up here with the message that as we read Scripture, we must allow the Word of God to examine our minds and hearts as we read it so that we can constantly be drawn closer into conformity and into intimacy with Jesus. Now, the work is never over on this side of heaven. The, 
the process of sanctification does not end on this side of eternity. And that's why we're doing this long walk through the book of Matthew together, to make sure that together we are comparing our image of Jesus to the way that he is revealed and to give ourselves many, many, many opportunities to continually put ourselves before Scripture, put ourselves before the Spirit of God and have our, our hearts examined. Now, last week we were in chapter 22, uh, we examining how following Jesus gives us hope for now and hope beyond now. And I said last week that I wanted to focus on that, on what Jesus taught about eternity, about heaven, because things have been getting more and more intense as we've been making our way through the gospel story. The flow of the gospel story has been funneling down to this event where Jesus is about to be arrested, unjustly tried, flogged, brought out before the masses, and then crucified. The entire gospel story has been funneling down to this event. And Jesus knew that as the clock ran, was running down to Friday, that he needed to make sure that his followers, the religious leaders, the people in the crowds, that they all had an opportunity to respond to his message. Now, I don't want to give the impression that Jesus has been bashful about his message at all uh, during the rest of the gospel story, like he's been sort of holding back for some reason. He had no problem confronting sin or in offering uh, opportunities for people to turn and repent from their sin. He had no problem putting those opportunities out there. He was not bashful at all. However, when he entered the city of Jerusalem for the last time, there's a noticeable shift in his approach. There's a noticeable shift in the intensity of his approach now. Uh, we read often in the gospel accounts that Jesus would fall back to secluded areas or away from cities into more rural parts of the country when the opposition that he was facing started to rise. And this was because he knew that as that opposition was rising, as he was getting these reactions out of these people who definitely didn't want to see him succeed, it wasn't his time yet. It wasn't time to go to the cross yet, and he needed to back off so that he didn't bring that about too soon. So when the opposition would rise, he would withdraw from those areas. He would go away. However, during the Passion Week, the kid gloves have clearly come off, and any subtlety that he may have, may have employed before has been thrown completely out the window. After his last confrontation with the people who were trying to discredit him back in chapter 22, Jesus is candid, just open about his judgment against the religious leaders who have not been faithful in their task of leading God's chosen people. Kid gloves are off. I'm telling you the way that it is now because my time is coming. Now, we'll talk through the content of chapter 23 together as we go through this message, but where I want to land this week is at the very end of the chapter, starting in verse 37, where Jesus says this. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until I say, or until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the good news of the gospel is that Jesus desires to have all creation reconciled back to him. The hard news of the gospel is that, Je the only, or that Jesus is the only way to salvation and he leaves the decision of whether or not we will take that salvation, whether we will call him Lord, whether we will commit ourselves to him. He leaves that up to the individual. The hardest news of the gospel is that we can have all the right answers. We can have all the right beliefs. We can have the world's most solid theology, but still miss out on the heart of the gospel. Jesus wants nothing more than to gather all people to himself, but ultimately he allows us 
to decide who our hearts belong to. And it's a heavy thing to say, and I know that. It's a heavy thing to say that it's possible to believe all the right things and yet still miss out on the heart of the gospel. It's an uncomfortable thing to say. It's uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. We've been given the message so often that salvation comes by faith alone that the idea of missing out might be scary or even offensive to some people. You may, if, as you hear that, you may even feel yourself pulling back and saying, like, no, slow your roll. If, if you're saying what I think you're saying, you've got to stop right now and we need to have a chat. You may be feeling that right now, and I get it. If Romans 10 said that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, then why am I telling you it's possible to miss out on the heart of the gospel even if you have the right beliefs, the right theology, even if you get everything about the Bible right? Why am I then telling you that it's possible to miss out? Well, it's because I believe that it's true. I believe that over the course of the gospel story, Jesus has said several times, given several examples of people who, have, who will say to him in the end, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not evangelize in your name? And Jesus will still say to those, get away from me, I, I, I don't know you. I say it because that's what Jesus has said many times over the course of the gospel story. And it's what he says about the religious leaders at the beginning of chapter 23. I'm just going to go to verses 2 and 3. This is where Jesus says to uh, to to the crowd that's around him, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. He says to the people listening, these people absolutely know their stuff. They are capable teachers. They just don't follow or uh, their practice, uh, or just don't follow their practice of the law. They don't practice what they preach. It's sort of like going to a nutritionist whose car is absolutely full of fast food bags. Like that nutritionist went to school, they are qualified to give you uh, advice and show you a way to eat healthy and have all the nutrients in your diet and they can give you that diet plan. They, they're completely qualified in that. But you probably shouldn't follow their example if their entire car is filled to the passenger side window uh, all the way to the ceiling in the passenger seat with all sorts of fast food wrappers. You probably should not follow their example even though they're a qualified expert. When we read the Gospels on this, or sorry, yeah, when we read the Gospels uh, on this side of history, we tend to see the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as these, these villainous opponents of Jesus, these bad guys in the Bible. They are actually almost like these mustache twirling villains, uh, and this is kind of the way that we we can be tempted to see uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, like they are these villainous opponents. The truth is that they were highly devoted and highly trained teachers of the law. They were not a devious cult by any means. They were the devoted shepherds of God's chosen people. They were obsessed with being right before God, and their sincerity could not possibly be questioned. They weren't villains. They were incredible scholars and theologians. The problem was that they were so focused on the details of the law that they missed out on seeing God's heart in the law. We'll pick it up at verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, But you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter. You should have practiced justice, mercy, and faithfulness without neglecting the former. You guys should have gotten it right. You should have practiced justice, mercy, and faithfulness while still doing the rest of the religious things that required in the law as well. 
One comes, in terms of sincerity, one comes before the other. Woe to you who have all the right answers, but fail to surrender your heart to God. It's absolutely possible to have the right theology and still miss out on following Jesus. The teachers of the law had unrivaled knowledge of God's word. But they were a lot like it being a wheel that wasn't attached to the axle. Yeah, technically they're functional, but they weren't attached to the thing that would make them of any use. They weren't attached to the hub that would actually attach them to the rest of the car. They did not see that God's desire, that, sorry, they did not see that God desires their hearts before their orthodoxy. That their orthodoxy comes from giving their heart to God. To be sure, God wants both. He does want us to have uh, a right doctrine. He wants us to be mature people who know his word well, who follow his word well. But right doctrine flows out of love for God and not the other way around. I'm going to move on to verses 29 and 30. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and de uh, decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. We we're not like those people from the past. We, we respect God's word. There's no way we would have done the things that those people did back then. It doesn't take a Bible college education to see the pattern of Israel's history that over the course of the Old Testament, God sent many prophets with the message to the people of Israel to turn from their sin, to repent, and to turn back to their covenant relationship with God. Many times throughout Scripture we see that, how God's covenant people walked away from their covenant relationship with God and how God constantly sent people to call them back. And more often than not, the people of Israel violently rejected those messengers. Now, of course, the religious leaders were all well aware of this history. After all, they were Bible experts. They had the law and the prophets, not just in front of them, but they actually were people who had these things memorized. It was right in there. They were incredibly familiar with Israel's history. They also had the benefit of hindsight, of looking back on the prophetic books and seeing that uh, the prophets like Zechariah or Zechariah and uh, uh, Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah, that all of these men were true prophets of God, that their prophecies came true. They had the benefit of hindsight of seeing that. And so they could look at those scriptures and they could look at the way that those people back then treated these prophets and they would say to themselves, if we had been back there, there's no way that we would have treated those prophets the way that those people treated them. We would have accepted them. We know that they were God's messengers. We would not have rejected them in the same way that those people did. And so they condemn the actions of the wicked people of the past. But that leads to the final thing that Jesus says at the very end of the chapter, starting in verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you see, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the gospel story, we see history repeat itself as Jesus is rejected by the very ones who should have recognized him and celebrated his arrival. We see history repeat itself as these men who had condemned the wicked people of the past 
for their inability to recognize authentic messengers from God repeat the exact same mistake with the Son of God. Here's the thing, though. Even though Jesus is fully aware of their rejection, he's still compassionate. He still offers an opportunity to turn it around. Even though he knows what's coming on Friday, he still offers anyone who will listen an opportunity to turn it around, to repent and acknowledge him. He still wants to see them turn from their pride and from their sin and choose to see him for who he really is. This past week, we had, a, uh, we had an elders board meeting. It's something that we do every month. And one of our elders opened us up in, uh, in a Bible study, in a, in a devotional time. As part of our work in discerning what God is calling us to pursue next as a church, we, as an elders board, have been looking at what Jesus had to say to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. Now this month we read what Jesus said to the Ephesian church, starting in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and found them false. You have persevered and endured hardship for my name, and you have not grown weary. Jesus saying to this Ephesian church, you guys are doing really well in these areas. You recognize good doctrine. You recognize false doctrine. You reject wickedness. You believe all the right things. You even persevere for my name and you don't grow weary. You are willing to suffer for me. But he goes on to say this, Yet, I hold this against you, even with all that good stuff. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent... I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, something I appreciated about the way that this elder presented this, the way that he said this, was that he pointed out that if you look back at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, this is not the first time you see the word of uh, the, uh, the, the church in Ephesus. Paul wrote a letter to them. It's called Ephesians. And if you look back at that, you will see from this description that Jesus gives them in Revelation 2, you will see that they have followed through on the challenge that Paul laid down for them before. They had rejected all forms of idolatry. They had rejected all forms of wickedness. They had rallied around the message that salvation is available to both the Jews and to the Gentiles through Jesus without exception, that there was nobody who was cut out from the salvation plan of Jesus. They had rallied around that message. They'd endured hardships. They'd stayed true to that teaching for decades. And Jesus, Jesus commends them for the fact that they have endured. He commends them for their faithful endurance. But he also said that they were at risk of being removed from God's kingdom work because they had lost sight of their first love. They'd had the right message, the right theology. They were willing to suffer and endure for the sake of the gospel. They got so much right. And that was all admirable, but Jesus still told them that they had lost sight of him in the middle, or that they had lost sight of him. So in the middle of all the good stuff, they had lost sight of what was most important. However, Jesus doesn't reject them for this. He tells them that they are getting what he tells them about what they're getting right and he calls them to refocus on what they're missing. He has no desire to eject them from his kingdom work. They just need to realign with his mission. Jesus wants nothing more than to gather all people to himself, but ultimately he allows us to decide for ourselves who our heart belongs to. I said at the beginning that I've been repeating 
a lot of the same things throughout our time in the book of Matthew. And I'm going to do it again here as we wrap up this, this time together. As with so many other parts of the gospel story, this portion stands as both a cautionary tale to not fall into the same trap of pride and religious piety that the, these religious leaders uh, who opposed Jesus had fallen into. And, and it's also an invitation to examine our own hearts before God. Now, I want to be clear on this point. I'm not saying any of this to try and intimidate anybody or possibly cause uh, fear and trepidation in anybody. This is not my point. I don't want to stand in front of you and, and use fear as a way of manipulating anybody. That's not what this is about. But the other part of being a pastor, the other part of being entrusted with preaching the word of God for the congregation is that I cannot back down from delivering the message of the gospel as it is revealed. And the revelation from Matthew 23 is this. Anyone who wants to follow Jesus must be honest about where their heart is, about who their heart belongs to. The mistake of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law was that they wanted to protect their pride. They relied on their piety and they wanted to, prote to protect their pride. They believed that their piety and their orthodoxy were what God desired. And yes, God does desire us to actually be good stewards of what he has shown us in Scripture. They condemned the mistakes of others but they did it as they were making the same mistake that others had made in the past. We are capable of the exact same piety, we are capable of the exact same pride as they were. We are capable of making the exact same mistake and missing out on the call that is at the heart of the gospel. We have so much, not in, in our modern time, we have so much information, we have so much knowledge about the Bible, so many resources that we can draw on, so much history to look back on and learn from. And because of all these different resources and the fact that every home has like maybe like one or six of these in it, the fact that we can be so familiar with it, we can become comfortable with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, we can become comfortable in our knowledge of God. We may rely on our belief in Jesus and our confession of his lordship without making it a reality in our hearts. Our orthodoxy can become this comfortable, warm blanket that assures us, as our ans as, uh, that assures us our answers are correct when people come and ask us questions about our faith. But while God wants us to have a mature understanding of Scripture and to serve and to be part of a church body and all those things, those are all good things, He is first and most interested in who our heart belongs to. So I want to end our time with this. Pride is a killer when it comes to following Jesus. It makes us blind and resistant to the things that he wants us to be aware of. We're capable of stifling the work of God's spirit in our lives if we are unwilling to drop our pride and listen to what he has to say. So this is my challenge to you for this week. Even as you're watching online, once you're finished with this, this is my challenge to you this week. I want you to open up your Bible. I want you to open it up to Psalm 139, the very end of the chapter, the last two verses. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. This has been something that 
I have been challenged by others to pray through. This is a passage that I have been challenged by others to pray through. And I want to extend that challenge to you as well this week. And even beyond this week. To pray through that passage. And then listen to hear what God's Spirit is saying to you once you've invited Him to come and examine you. I know that this is difficult. And you know, for some, this may not be the first time. This may be the, hundred, the 891st time that you've done this. But I still want to challenge you to do it anyway. And if there is something in you that is resisting it, I want you to ask this question of yourself. What do you stand to lose if you do it anyway? Even if you're resisting it, even if you don't want to, what do you stand to lose by praying through this passage? And then listening. You are resisting it. What is it in your heart that is trying to protect itself by not doing this? What will it take to surrender that, that thing that's trying to protect itself, that thing that's trying to keep itself alive in there? What will it take to surrender that to Jesus? As you consider that, remember that Jesus wants nothing more than to gather all people to himself, than to reconcile everyone to himself. But ultimately, he allows us to decide who our hearts belong to. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to say goodbye. God, even as we are doing this in, in this way, Lord, I pray that your spirit would be speaking to each and every one who hears this. That God, if there is resistance to wanting to be examined by your spirit, that Lord, you would give us the courage to overcome it. God, I want to pray for each and every one who does pray through this passage. That for each and every one who invites you to examine them, to see where their heart belongs. That Lord, by your mercy, you would guide them. That, Lord, you would show us the corners of our heart that we have not surrendered fully to you. That, Lord, you would not leave us to be in that space. But, God, do not leave us to miss out on the heart of your gospel. Draw us to yourself. Give us courage to give you access to those private parts of our heart. Lord, give us clarity where it is that we need to surrender to you. And by your grace, God, allow us the strength to surrender those things to you. In your name I pray, God. Amen. I want to thank you for putting up with this. Glad that you were able to join us in this way. God bless you, and we're looking forward to seeing you soon.